Welcome to the July Nickopedia Popcast. We'll have Fallout News, Creek's feature, and an interview with Lawrence at Modus later in the show. But first, let's cross to Layman's Reign and Mr. House with Fallout History. I am Robert Edwin House, President, CEO, and sole proprietor of the New Vegas Strip. Before the Great War of 2077, I was the founder, president, and CEO of Robco Industries, a vast computer and robotics corporation. Robert House is one of the most controversial figures in Fallout history. Some see him as a hero, rising from orphan to self-made billionaire, while others see him as a narcissistic member of the elite, protected by his wealth. This is Fallout History, where we explore some of the biggest people and events in Fallout. I'm Layman's Rain, and this month we tell the story of Robert House, up to the outbreak of the Great War. Robert House is known after the war as the ruler of New Vegas. It should be no surprise that he and his half-brother Anthony were raised in Las Vegas by his grandfather following the deaths of his parents in a tragic accident. It was a place of splendor. As magnificent as today's strip may seem, it's but a shadow of the neon paradise that was Las Vegas. I grew up not far from here, and though I traveled the old world extensively, I never found another place like it. The family had wealth thanks to its successful operation of the h and Tools Company, but House's relationship with his brother soon became acrimonious. His older brother would swindle Robert out of his share of the family fortune, including his share of the business. Robert, however, could not be counted out. Despite this setback, he attended the Commonwealth Institute of Technology. Then at 22, on June 25, 2042, he founded his own company, Robco Enterprises. Five years later, House would claim that Robco was one of the most profitable companies on Earth, and three years later, as much as $30 billion. This would roll into other businesses, Repcon, casino hotels, and eventually even taking back the business his brother had stolen, H&H Tools, as well as joint ventures with other companies. As Robco and Repcon Marketing explains... Robco Industries purchased Repcon in 2075 to assist with some of Robco's military projects, as well as developing unmanned space exploration. The relationship between Robco and Repcon is mutually beneficial, and we hope both companies bolster each other well into the next century. vault has selected the Robco Industries Robco Pip-Boy 2000 as the personal information processor of choice for its vault dwellers. The Robco Pip-Boy 2000, hereafter called the Pip-Boy, is a handy device that you wear on your wrist. It's small, especially by today's standards, and it will store a godly amount of information for you, and using modern super deluxe resolution graphics to boot! Socially, however, House was seen as an eccentric. Reports in tabloids would suggest that when out with the ladies, he was more interested in other things. Raul Tejada, who survived the apocalypse, remembers. I remember there were some weird stories about him, especially near the end. There was a tell-all in El Periodico de las Aburridas by a starlet house dated. She said they never, um... Don't make me spill it out, boss. Anyway, she said all he wanted to do was scan her brain and make her dress up in different outfits. House's brilliance, however, wasn't limited to the business world. He predicted that the end was coming, and put into place a plan to deal with it. By 2065, I deemed it a mathematical certainty that an atomic war would devastate the Earth within 15 years. Every projection I ran confirmed it. I knew I couldn't save the world, nor did I care to. But I could save Vegas, and in the process, perhaps save mankind. I set to work immediately. I thought I had plenty of time to prepare. As it turned out, I was 20 hours short. That 20 hours would have allowed him to update the operating system he was reliant on, and we'll discuss the implications of that more in our next episode. However, it's fair to say his preparations were extensive. Still, House was his own toughest critic. On the day of the Great War, 77 atomic warheads targeted Las Vegas, Hoover Dam, and its surrounding areas. 
My networked mainframes were able to predict and force transmit disarm code subsets to 59 warheads, neutralizing them before impact. Laser cannons mounted on the roof of the Lucky 38 destroyed another nine warheads. The rest got through, though none hit the city itself. A suboptimal performance, admittedly. Although House may have been less than impressed with his performance, it was an effort that exceeded anyone else's. An effort that was only possible when House started Robco Industries on June 25th, 2042. And now a word from our sponsor. In a world where solid-state electronics and vacuum tubes are still meta, people never stop loving atomic-powered everything. A chosen 500 stepped inside a subterranean vault to be spared the nuclear horror of the inevitable Great War. 25 years later, they emerge after the fallout settles to retake Appalachia. Among them, two former rivals whose blood feud will tear West Virginia apart in their epic struggle for survival. Chad, a vault bro who has a strength of 15, an intelligence of two, and is a complete wasteland dickhead. Simon, a complicated anti-hero who chooses light and hope, but accidentally becomes a cannibal and wakes up naked and afraid with a Scorch Beast Queen after a date goes terribly wrong. What? I mean, it's a wild wasteland, right? This dark humor radio drama will have you driving off the road and crawling out from under the fallout. Two men. One wasteland. And so many nukes. Chad, a Fallout 76 podcast, rated R. Now streaming on your holotape player podcasty thing. Nookpedia Network News, I'm Agent C. Bethesda caused quite a stir the other week when they placed on the public test server an update with no patch notes ahead of time, and requiring all users to go through the new user experience. It seems Bethesda was testing out changes to the way that new players are onboarded to the game, allowing players to skip to level 20, earlier access to power armor, and preset loadouts for special perk cards. And preset loadouts for special perk cards. Other improvements are to the names and orders of workshop items, as well as tips telling you how to get workshop items unlocked. Concurrently with this, mining from data miners has suggested the next scoreboard will be Enclave focused, and appears to be shorter than usual. We'll have more on this as it comes out, and the public test server is expected to return in the coming weeks, so stay tuned. We've also been following the Microsoft Activision purchase. In case you're wondering and haven't been following this yourself, Microsoft's now the owner of ZeniMax, and therefore Bethesda, as well as Obsidian, who made Fallout New Vegas, and Exile, who made Wastelands 2 and 3. This has led to regulators worldwide querying Microsoft's attempts to purchase Activision, and that has led to a court case between Microsoft and the US's Federal Trade Commission. Bethesda has been coming up again and again in Microsoft's suit with the FTC. The end of the court case, however, seems to have slipped a bit under the radar, with the court allowing the merger to go ahead. The FTC did announce plans to appeal the verdict, However, as the Court of Appeals has denied a request to pause the merger while the appeal is heard, it does appear at this stage it is going ahead. Similar issues with regulators worldwide do appear to now be in the negotiation phase, and Sony and Microsoft have signed a deal ensuring Call of Duty remains cross-platform for at least the next 10 years. In the Fallout, if you'll pardon the pun, the biggest news for Fallout fans is news suggesting that Fallout 76 may have actually been close to cancellation. In September 2021, Microsoft's Phil Spencer in an email chain said that he felt the game either needed to reach the 10 million monthly active user mark, or be moved on from. The next month, the game came to what is now known as PlayStation Plus, and the game has obviously continued to see updates. We also had confirmation that the next game from the ZeniMax family, Machine Games' Indiana Jones game, will be an Xbox console exclusive. This and the exclusivity of Redfall and Starfield caused some confusion for Bethesda's Pete Hines 
when Microsoft announced its intention to keep Call of Duty multi-platform, asking Todd Howard in an email if this position wasn't exactly the opposite of what they had just been asked or told to do with their titles. We've also learned that the next Elder Scrolls game is more than five years away, so don't hold out for a new Fallout anytime soon. We've also learned that it was Microsoft's fear that Starfield might be a PlayStation exclusive that led to their purchase of Zenimax, following examples of Deathloop and Ghostwire being PlayStation exclusive. Microsoft spent $7.5 billion on the purchase. Some big news in Modland, Nuevo Mexico, who we talked to a few months ago, has issued out a big new trailer taking Fallout to New Mexico, as well as the other Mexico, would that be Mexico Classic? We'll include a link to that in the description. And lastly, we cross to our reporter Ellis, who has been covering the Microsoft and Starfield showcases. More features from Starfield have been made public, whetting the appetites of fans eager to experience Bethesda's next big title. The Starfield Direct event showcased several gameplay features available within the title. Bethesda's new fictional universe in a quarter century will come with a quote-unquote feeling of being who you want to be and exploring a new world, according to game director Todd Howard's recent presentation. For its space flight sections, Starfield will have a significant amount of ship customization. Players will have the ability to change the outside appearance of their ships and customize their armaments for space combat missions. Additionally, players will have the ability to increase their ship's capacity for more crew members. When compared with the lack of ship customization in No Man's Sky, and Star Citizen still in relatively early stages of development, it seems that Starfield is looking to take over the market as the next major spaceflight sim. Additionally, Bethesda has also displayed some of the character traits that players will be able to utilize when creating their character. Various personality traits and backgrounds for the player character will be components of the character customization. There's speculation that the player character's background could be altered based on actions that the player takes during the game. There are three backgrounds that can be selected during the character creation. Fans and gaming journalists believe that this background feature will give players added motivation to replay the game multiple times while making different choices throughout the story. Starfield will be released on September 6th for Xbox Series X and Series S and PC. In other Bethesda news, Fallout 76 continues to expand, with Atlantic City being the latest location to join the post-apocalypse. Aside from the expansions trailer, we don't have a great deal of information on the expansion itself. According to the official Bethesda blog for the game, quote, Prepare for high rollers and higher stakes when Fallout 76 embarks players on an all-new expedition to Atlantic City, coming soon for all players. With so many ways to play, you too can answer the call of 76, unquote. Bethesda hasn't announced a release date, but the studio assures players that the expansion is coming soon. All in all, it's shaping up to be a very exciting few months ahead for Bethesda products. Reporting in the field, I'm LS. That's it for Nukipedia Network News. I've been Agent C. If you have a project coming up you think we should cover, email us at nukafalloutwiki at gmail.com. Now here's LS with Creature Feature. Hello everyone and welcome to the Fallout Creature Feature where we take a look at some of the most notable animals, monsters, and strange beings that inhabit the wasteland. I'm LS, and today we're discussing some of the deadliest monsters in the Wasteland. The Deathclaws have been the absolute bane of many a Wasteland Traveler. Just a couple of swipes with their deadly claws, hence the name, can send any waster flying. The Deathclaws were originally engineered by the American government prior to the Great War. They were designed to be cheap replacements for human troops during close combat operations. Even though the experiments were successful, and the deadly predators were capable of fighting and surviving on their own, we don't have any records of them ever being employed in the field of battle. After the world ended, the Deathclaws no longer encumbered by any kind of government control, they escaped into the wild and spread across the North American continent. Even though the Enclave had nothing to do with their creation, the Appalachian Enclave has noted that they look similar to other Enclave projects. At one point, a significant number of Deathclaws were refined by the Master through genetic manipulation and the forced evolutionary virus. Eventually, Deathclaws gained a reputation among the human population as legendary predators and at the top of the wasteland food chain. 
Deathclaws were designed to be bipedal, meaning they walk on two legs instead of four. This was a conscious choice by the creators, since making them bipedal would allow the Deathclaws to raise their heads, thus providing them with a greater field of vision with which to detect targets or resources. Bipedalism also allowed the creators of the Deathclaws to forge their upper limbs into powerful weapons. Arguably the toughest melee combatants in the Wastes, Deathclaws can eliminate humans in a manner of a few swipes, sometimes even only needing one blow. Additionally, they possess a significant degree of toughness in terms of health and resistance to weapons. The Deathclaws found in the Commonwealth have even been known to have hides that reflect laser weapons. It's well known that Brotherhood of Steel patrols have suffered major casualties after unwittingly entering Deathclaw territories. At one point, the Enclave attempted to modify packs of Deathclaws with the use of a strain of the forced evolutionary virus, and later on domestication units, but these experiments did not always work in the Enclave's favor. Deathclaws, being pack animals, have an alpha male and an alpha female as the leaders of each pack. Additionally, packs of the creatures are extremely territorial, and won't be afraid to charge against anything they deem to be intruders. The females will lay eggs in large clusters, meaning that at any one point there could be numerous new dangers being hatched. Deathclaws are arguably the most dangerous creatures that any weary traveler can come across in the wasteland. They need to be treated with extreme caution. If you ever come across a Deathclaw, do not, under any circumstances, take them lightly. Otherwise, you'll end up as another poor victim, struck down by these legendary creatures of Wasteland lore. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fallout Creature Feature. For the Nukipedia Pipcast, I'm L.S. Joining us this week on Public Occurrence is Lawrence from the Modus Files. How are you doing there, Lawrence? I'm doing well today. How about yourself? Oh, I'm just doing just fine here. So every time that we've done one of these interviews with a Fallout creator, your name keeps coming up. So I thought we, we had to get you on sooner rather than later. We've seen that you've done a lot there with the Modus Files. Is everything going well with the series so far? Everything's going swimmingly. I actually never thought it would get quite as big as it's gotten. So it's a pleasure to be part of this community, and it's a even greater pleasure to tell a, a great story within the Fallout universe. And, and it is certainly a great story there. So I usually start my interviews by asking, how did you get into Fallout? Are you a new fan, or are you an old fan, or are you something in between? So I'd say it was something in between. Uh, the first time, so I had heard of Fallout and been exposed to a little bit of the lore in the past, but then my kids got me Fallout 4 for Christmas one year. And I ended up playing it for a little bit, kind of fell out of it, but then got back into it and finished the whole story. And, and then at that point, really got intrigued by the story of Fallout. So I started with Fallout 4. I went back to Fallout 3. Then I played Fallout New Vegas. Then I went backwards again and I played Fallout 1 and Fallout 2. So I actually kind of went in reverse um, of the mm -hmm. games that came out. And and for me, I'm I'm a bit of an armchair historian, so... Learning the history of the Fallout universe, the history, you know, before the Great War, the Great War, and then the lore of the games itself really intrigued me and is what really got me interested in wanting to do more actually in Fallout. And then Fallout 76 was my, I think, my really deep dive into Fallout and my first experience actually even overall in multiplayer, a multiplayer experience. And... I can tell you, it has certainly even changed my life. It is, I've met people, I've become part of a community. I have really good friends that are now part of Fallout and, and are friends of mine. So it's it's really been this evolution from just wanting to learn more about Fallout to really wanting to be part of, I think, a really excellent community. It, it certainly is a game that has for many years been very successful at building communities. So you mentioned that you sort of started with the new ones and then went back to Going back to the older ones then give you a different perspective on the newer ones? You know, it did. And I can appreciate a lot of the irreverent humor that you find in Fallout 1 and Fallout 2 and, of course, all throughout Fallout New Vegas. And what I really appreciated about the games themselves is that they didn't take themselves too seriously. I think when you look at games like Halo and some of the newer games that are out there that have a rich lore, in many mm -hmm. cases, they're very 
I, I don't want to say necessarily matter of fact, but they lack, I think, a bit of humor and the ability to tell stories because their lore is so set in stone. And what I really loved about Fallout is the little Easter eggs, the fact that, you know, Doctor Who is referenced, you know, the Roswell <laughs> is referenced, um, mm -hmm. you know, different things that you find in some of the older Fallout games, which you do sometimes find a little bit of that in the later games, though it's not quite as evident. But what I really do ultimately love about Fallout is the just the irreverence or, or the fact that there's this humor built into it where it doesn't take itself too seriously. And I believe that's actually one of the reasons why you see such longevity is that you can laugh along with the game and it's not all necessarily gloom and doom that there is humor in the wasteland and i really appreciate that and i loved it when i started playing fallout 1 and especially in fallout 2 some of the dialogue options that you have are quite frankly hilarious yeah it's something you don't often see in post-apocalyptic content it's usually pretty dark and doom and gloom and everything's over but as one of the Xbox songs might put it, 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 it's not all over, but the crying. So for those who haven't heard the Modus Files, can you tell us a bit more about the podcast? So it's designed to be an in-game story to actually answer a lot of unanswered questions within the Fallout 76 world. And if you look at Fallout 76, it was really designed to be very much a blank slate. I believe that's what Bethesda was really going for when they developed mm -hmm. the game that they create this overarching story, but because there weren't any NPCs to begin with and we were resonance coming out of the vault, it was an opportunity for each of us to tell our own stories. And I wanted to tell a story within this universe that actually took the perspective of what most people would consider to be the bad guys. And I always find that if you're going to have really excellent heroes, you have to have very compelling villains. So the story of the Modus Files is residents who leave Vault 76, which is designed to house the best and brightest of America, who go out into Appalachia and rebuild. And these residents actually find Modus underneath the White Springs. And this is the story of a revived enclave. So this is the story told from the perspective of what most people would be considered villains. And beginning this story of rebuilding, but from that perspective. So you have the story of Colonel Valeria Faustina, whose parents were military folks inside the vault, who came out of the vault wanting to follow in their footsteps. Then you have Lilith, who is an FEV experiment. Her father worked for West Tech and actually experimented on her as a baby. So she is more than human. Many people would say that she's psychotic and a cannibal. Well, you know, she, she's precocious. Mm -hmm. And these individuals then start developing the story within the confines of Fallout 76. So we have this story of rebuilding, of the interactions with Modus, and it really shows all of what's happening in Appalachia, what's happening within Fallout 76. We represent, or we, we represent a lot of the lore that's in the game. We reference incidents that happen as you as a character are going through the game, but from our perspective. And like any good story, we do veer off of script, so we're not necessarily following the exact story that's out there. But it's a podcast told in the style of an audio drama from the 40s and 50s, following our characters as they venture out into this new wasteland and experience this world. But again, told from the perspective of people that you would expect, oh, well, these are the villains. These are the antagonists, not the protagonists, which I think makes a very compelling tale. And the fact that people have actually fallen in love with people like Lilith and with Valeria and with Major Stein, I think shows that people understand that Fallout is very much a gray universe. Even people that you would consider to be the good guys aren't always going to be doing things that are considered good. So it's really given us, I think, the opportunity to tell a very expansive story. And I think we're over 60 episodes now. So it's something that the community seems to have embraced. And we're very proud of the work that we've done. 60 episodes is certainly an achievement. And it is a lot to get to grips with if you haven't heard it before. If someone was to start listening today, would you point them back to episode one or is there a better spot for them to pick up on the story? So I would say that new listeners actually have two options. They can start from episode one, which is me really just explaining the overall concept of the, what the Modus Files will become and, and the very beginnings of the story. Or we actually created a mini series called The Last Days of Appalachia. 
And if you look at the lore of Fallout 76, there was a story that happened before we exited the vault. And this was the story of Appalachia right after the war, the rise of the raiders, the mistress of mysteries, the enclave, the responders, the free states. And these were all factions that existed within the region before, again, we leave the vault. And this is, again, the factions that were actually destroyed by the Scorched, if you know the story of Fallout 76. So mm -hmm. our miniseries called The Last Days of Appalachia tells the story of the last days and literally hours of these factions. So it's a way to actually bridge the two stories. What happens when, you know, the Enclave falls, when the responders fall, when you have the last member of the Free States that actually goes out into Appalachia? So really your two options are either start with episode one or find the first of the last days of Appalachia, which was called Live by the Sword, which again begins telling the story of how Appalachia really fell apart in the first place, which has a lot of parallels with the story that we're telling today. Plus, we also did a couple of one-off episodes. I mean, my favorite episode, I think, of all time, and again, I, I, I love all of them, but there's one that just uh, sticks out for me, which is the story that we did. It was our Halloween episode, I believe it was, not last year, but the year before, which would have been 2021, which was the Journal of Bethany Miller. And if you're looking for just a really creepy, excellently told story about certain individuals within this Fallout 76 universe, that Journal of Bethany Miller episode is, I think, one of the best. And I love the, the voice actors is Vitriol Plays, and she just does an awesome job. So really, so that kind of gives you three entries into the story. That's awesome that you've got multiple ways to jump into it there. And we'll try and have some links to those down in the notes down below. Now, as I've mentioned in, in previous interviews that we've done, a lot of other podcast creators mention your name a lot as someone who has been influential and has helped get the start of the journey there. How do you suggest they go about it? So, start? I think maybe to answer that question, I should go into a little bit of details of how I started. I actually got into Fallout 76 and met some really cool people. And through those interactions with people in the game, I started to write a story. I literally sat down at my computer. I opened up my Google Drive. I started a document and I started writing about my character. What do they like? What do they dislike? What kind of interactions would they have in the wasteland? Before I knew it, I had close to a thousand pages that I had written of all different kinds of attributes of the characters, their interactions, following the story. And originally, I was actually going to write it as a book. But then I realized that if you're going to take an existing IP and write something, well, you run into all sorts of legal issues. I talked to Ken from the Chad podcast, and I explained to him what I was doing, what I wanted to do. And he literally rocked my world by just saying, well, why don't you do a podcast? And I had never considered that before. I had no experience doing it. And I was like, oh, okay. So I downloaded some software, I started writing some scripts, and I just did it. And over time, I've learned how to do special effects. I built a fairly extensive cast. I've learned, I think, a lot about what I was doing. And it took a long time, but it was more, it was definitely worthwhile. I mean, for me, this is my COVID coping mechanism. So this got me through COVID. And at the same time, I think it built something that I really wanted to build, which was this idea of just telling a really compelling story. At the end of the day, my biggest fan is my son. He's 12 years old. He listens to every single episode. He's been in one of the episodes. And for me, even if nobody else listened to it, the most important thing to me was that he loved it and he wanted to be a part of it. Now, to go back to answering the question, if you want to tell a story within the Fallout universe, I would just say do it. The idea is that you write. Put down what you want to convey to the audience. With no expectations. Don't go into it thinking that you're going to be popular. Don't think that you're going to get a million downloads. It's really more around telling the story that you want to tell. Because this isn't a job. This is a labor of love. And if you want to do it, treat it as such. Don't stress yourself out about it. Don't think that you have to meet any other anyone else's expectation but your own. Because people will find you. And to me, the most important thing is that you just do it and you don't need to go in and do a ton of special effects. You don't need to throw yourself out there and spend hours upon hours and upon hours doing it. My advice is first things first, write what you want to. 
and then put it out there for people to listen to and ignore the critics, ignore people that maybe want to hate on you, that you're breaking lore or whatever. The great thing about the Fallout 76 community is that we are a community of creators. We were given a blank slate. And I think a lot of us have taken that opportunity to build out stories that we want to tell. And sure, they don't all align. And heck, you can take a multiversal attitude about it and that these are all different universes of, of where we exist together. But at the end of the day, it's about doing what you want to do. So as I've told, you know, multiple people, you know, Mandy is a great friend of mine who, who started out with the Podax a long time ago, who does 13. But one of the things I mm -hmm. told her was, you know, just do it. You want to tell this story, sit down in front of your computer, decide what you want to do, and then go ahead and present it. And she's done wonderfully. Once Upon a Wasteland, again, Brad and I are great friends, and I've really enjoyed his story. And again, my advice to him originally was, you have a perspective that not a lot of people have. You have great characters. Put them out there and don't really care about what people think about them. Tell the story that you want to tell. Because at the end of the day, the only person that you should be satisfying is yourself. Because the moment that you try to compromise your own ideas, your ideals, your characters to try to make them more popular, now you've created a job for yourself and now you've sacrificed your creative integrity. And I'm a firm believer that that's just something that a creator should never do. Because unless you plan on trying to make money out of this, which hardly anybody ever can do, the idea is that you are an entertainer, and that's really what you should focus on. Now, of course, I can get into the minutiae of how you actually create a script or things like that, but you really need to have the mentality at the end of the day that this is your story. You should be comfortable telling it in the way that you find most appropriate. I've taken a very much of kind of an audiobook way of, of doing a podcast, whereas Once Upon a Wasteland is very much more the standard style of, hey, there's no narrator. It's strictly dialogue between individuals. Ken's podcast, Chad, is very much the same way. Don't be afraid of trying something different. Don't be afraid to take characters in different directions. Because again, at the end of the day, it's the story that you want to tell. And the hardest step is that first one. But once you've taken that first step, it really does open up just a huge amount of canvas for you to start really creating on. Wow. That, thanks very much for that. I know that that has very much enthused me to get back at the writing I know I should be doing, but I do fully agree. You know, if you do have a story out there, start writing it down, start telling it and worry about everything else later. A big thing of what we try and do on this podcast is we do try and spotlight other creators there that are maybe not getting as much attention as they should be. Are there maybe one or two of those that you can think of we can put a bit of a spotlight on? Oh, wow. I mean, to me... It's interesting because I get to interact with so many creators. I mean, I've fallen in love with a number of artists that I've worked with. You know, nobody is a fantastic artist in the community. There's Miss Major, who's who's also great. You know, Overshy and Turtle uh, have been great to me. But of course, you know, again, they're very well known within the community. There's Vivian. Actually, I definitely want to call out Vivian from Dearly Cryptid, who <laughs> I worked with a while back, who is a very... And I'll say esoteric artist, but I think she has a very unique style, very much, I think, representative of the Fallout universe, but definitely with a different take on it. Artist wise, I mean, like I said, I've been very lucky to work with just a, a huge number of them. From a podcast perspective, I can't really say enough about what Mandy's done with 13. I think going back and telling some of those older Fallout stories really helps the community only because it's showing us where Fallout came from, but putting particular spins on it. There's also, and I'll mention this because I, I don't think she's really done too much with it yet, but Bree, who is also a casual in a corset, uh, who works with my AOL password, does a lot of streaming, is actually starting to work on her own podcast. She has definitely the chops to put out something great. So she's actually at that beginning stage and I very much encouraged her. There's also Chris from One Wall Comedy who does a lot of Fallout-related comedy on his YouTube channel. We highlight all of these in our podcast, but it just goes to show that we live and work and breathe within a community that just has so many people that put out so many different perspectives, and I love each and every one of them. I think that you could spend days upon days upon days just running into one new creator after the other who's doing something different, interesting, whether it's art, whether it's a stream, whether it's a podcast whether it's something on their YouTube channel. 
I literally just can't talk about all of them because there's just so freaking many of them and I've loved every second of it. That there absolutely are. So just before we do wrap up, if someone was, does want to follow what you're doing, what are the best ways to follow both yourself and the podcast? So the easiest way, and I think the one that we're most active on is still on Twitter. So it's at Modus Files, and that's one word, where we post up information about the podcast. We also post up a lot of our art that we get commissioned, along with just little tidbits about the podcast. We're also at Modus Files, actually, on Instagram as well, so you can follow us there. But we also have a really good website, which is just themodusfiles.com. So if you go onto our website, you get links to the links to the podcast. We also have information about the various episodes and our cast members. We're also available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, Google, Google Podcasts. We're on Amazon Podcasts. So it's just just look for us at the Modus Files. We're very easy to find. We put out a lot of great information. We try to put out episodes about every three to four weeks. We're actually very close to the end of our second season. We've got two more episodes coming in. Quite frankly, they are going to be monster episodes. I believe they're at least going to be two to two and a half hours long each. So think of it as going in to watch a major motion picture. And we will not disappoint. It is going to be a wild ride. Two and a half hours. That sounds epic. How do you manage 60 to 70 the, pages, the time these for last that? two episodes? Just keeps me sane. Are when I wrote these scripts, between 125 and 130 pages about, each. So you're talking 20,000 words, probably a thousand lines of dialogue. It's what gets me out of bed in the morning. This is very important to me. This is truly a passion project. And I just really want to tell a really cool story. I would say I put between 30 to 40 hours into each episode. These next ones are going to be much longer than that. But it's worth my while because, again, we've really wanted to tell a story that's worthy of follow-up. And we believe that this is exactly what the community wants. We believe that everybody will be tr truly excited. And when we set up our third season, which will actually be the last season of this particular iteration of The Modus Files, it is going to blow people away. They are going to get a story that is going to be New Vegas in size and scale. And we're going to have a resolution that's going to wrap up all of the questions that I think everybody's always had about why nobody talks about Appalachia in the future. Well, I can't wait to, to hear how that all goes. So thanks very much for joining us there, Lawrence. Oh, no problem at all. It's been my pleasure.